it's a it's a difficult question because first we have to understand in a precise way what we mean by uh, economic behavior. It's not so obvious. Uh, we can understand this uh, this phrase economic behavior at at least two levels. One is the individual level, and for instance, by uh, I have an economic behavior in the sense maybe that I optimize something. I'm an optimizer, so I will I will speak about that in a more precise in a more precise way. And the other way we can address this question is at the collective level, the aggregate level. What is a, an economic organization? How we recognize an economic organization? What kind of economic behaviors make up an economic organization? So, for instance, there are some uh, social animals, uh, ants, bees, animals like that, or even other animals we don't think of. Uh, at the aggregate level, do they have an economic behavior? Do they exemplify an economy? So this, this is a very difficult question. So I have to divide my uh, my talk between those two aspects and then try to make sense of them together. First, at the um, at the individual level, uh, in in economics or at least in view economics or uh, neuroeconomics, we use animal models. Uh, we use animals in order to understand human economic behavior. What does it mean? It means that those animals, obviously, they try to maximize something. They try to survive in their environments. They try to optimize uh, their fitness, for instance. So we have a set of evolutionary considerations about those animals. And the classical, standard, very standard economic models, microeconomic models that we can use, uh, capture very well those behaviors. In fact, to some extent, microeconomic models capture even more animal behavior, basic animal, individual animal behavior, than human behavior. So this is very interesting. But this is the very individual level. And in a sense, it's not specific enough. We are talking about the basic biological, evolutionary, evolved behavior, maximizing one's utility, survive. Is it enough to speak of uh, economic behavior? This is something that we find everywhere in nature. Even plants, in fact, in that sense, exemplify economic behavior. I'm interested into plant, in, into plant economics those days. but. You see the distance between plants and humans. So it's, it's a too broad a notion, in fact. So let's go back to the other aspect, the collective aspect, the social aspect. Uh, in order to, to recognize in nature economic behavior, we can speak of uh, noticing, observing a certain organization. For instance, division of labor. Some do that, some others do that. We, we, we can see that, we can observe that in ants' colonies, in bees, beehives. Uh, is, it is it an economy in a serious sense? Do we observe an economy in a, in a beehive or in an ants' colony? I'm not so sure. It's not because we have an appearance of collective rationality or of organization that we have an economy and that we have an economic behavior. So now I will define positively what I understand by economic behavior. It's something in the between, between individual behavior and between social organization. So it's not so sure that a, an ant or a bee exemplify an economic behavior, even though it belongs to a kind of a society. And also an animal in isolation or a human in isolation, even though he optimizes or it optimizes its survival, it's not so sure that it exemplifies economic behavior. We need something in the middle. We need something that connects the social society or social organization and individual behavior. This is where, where I think the problem lies. So the problem is one of uh, some animals like us have developed very complex environment, social environment. So to be sure with a division of labor, with specialization, with trades, exchanges, speculation about the future. The temporal element is very important. The sequential element is very important, that we can foresee, that we make interpol choices, sequential choices. Animals can do that. So in that extent, animal, animals have economic behavior because they place their immediate behavior into an interpol structure. Some animals can do that. For instance, some birds can do that. Blue jays. Blue jays are reputed for being able to, to, 
to make interpretable choices, to foresee the future to some extent, to store some goods in view of future consumption. So economic behavior should be defined as uh, having a dual component, connecting a certain kind of uh, individual optimal behavioral patterns to the social organizations. And this is very interesting because this is where the problem lies for uh, people interested like me in the biology of economics or even in neuroeconomics, um, because sometimes the two don't fit. Uh, in the past 20 or 30 years, or even more than that, a lot of behavioral economists have noticed that we don't optimize all the time. And uh, some of them uh, have referred this non-optimal behavior to uh, our biological fabric, the way that our brain is wired uh, to certain environments, but not to other environments. So in some environment, we are not optimizers, but in so other environments, we optimize. So there is something like a fitness between a brain, or in more general terms, I would say, a cognitive system, which is biologically realized, and a certain type of environments. So the degree of fitness between the two is what defines for me the optimality of economic behavior. It's not only the cognitive system itself, it's not only the social structure, structure itself that are optimal, it's the fit between the two that defines optimal or non-optimal economic behavior. So interestingly, I hold a, a, a general hypothesis about this, which is that for us humans, we have developed, as I said before, very sophisticated, very complex uh, economic environments in which we are not always optimal in which it's not possible or not even sometimes desirable to maximize some utility, to maximize some satisfaction. Okay. And this is part, in fact, of our biological uh, reality. Because not optimizing may be optimal, in fact. If we think of the connection between our brains, or us as cognitive systems, and the environment we have built. But on the other hand, there are some other problems. There is what I call a functional lag, maybe. A functional lag between the abilities, the biological abilities and cognitive abilities we have developed across our evolution and the environment we have built. Maybe we have built too much a complex environment, an environment which is too complex for our brains to continue to adapt to this very environment that we have built. And maybe the idea of a bias, the idea of non-optimality, can be referred to this functional lag between the environment we ourselves have built and our abilities as they come, how they are rooted in our evolu evolution, you see? So if we uh, come back to bees and ants, I don't see any kind of functional lags between those cognitive systems, those biological systems, which are ants or bees or other animals, and the uh, ant colonies or the beehives or the particular environment in which those animals evolve, move every day, they live in. There is like a fundamental adequacy, adaptivity. But by contrast, us humans, we have built maybe, we have built maybe some environments in which we are not so much adapted today. And this is, I think, where there is a new possibility of research to understand what we have called biases in the past 10 years, or 20 years, or 30 years. You know, a behavioral economists have said we should incorporate biases into our economic model. Uh, in fact, uh, this is one way of doing things. My way of doing things is to say those biases maybe reflect some fundamental, recent in terms of evolution, inadaptability, inadequacy between our basic biological capacities and economic environments. One, uh, one aspect of um, co complexity of uh, our environments in which we have to make decisions is the temporal structure of those environments, the fact that we have to plan for the future, or also the fact that our, our decisions can be sequential one step now, one step later, and we have to foresee all those steps. 
So interestingly, in economics, in experimental economics, we have tested our ability to deal with those temporal structures. It is what is called intertemporal choice theory. And we have documented, as I said, a lot of biases uh, with respect to those decisions. We, uh, we display impatience. We are not able to foresee the future. We discount the future utility. Uh, interestingly, we have used blue jays. Some people have used blue jays, and I've studied blue jays in that respect. Uh, blue jays, they fail when we give them binary choice, one, one choice, one, one reward, one bigger reward later and one uh, lesser reward now, they always go to the lesser reward. So they show, in, they display impatience, they discount utility. But now if we change the environment, if we make the environment more sequential, and if we give the possibility in that environment to go forward and backward, forward and backward like that, to move across time, then they are optimal. So you see that documenting a bias in economic, in experimental economics, depends on the way we formalize and the way we implement the structure of, decision, of the decision environment. If we move the environment, sometimes the, the, the bias disappears. So this is exactly the topic that I wanted to illustrate. I want to illustrate that the problem is not uh, making a decision on one side and having an environment or a structure on the other side, but it is the interplay between the decision and the environment that will define whether we are optimal or not, and whether our evolution have developed some good adaptive uh, decision mechanism in order to optimize in that environment. This is where the problem of the study of economic behavior and the biology of economic behavior lies, I think.